Good evening to everyone. We have one more minute before we start. Well, we'll wait until about 7.02. So we have about three minutes before we start. Hopefully everyone is doing well this evening. Go ahead and be placing your name in your campus in the chat. Go ahead and be turning your cameras on. And rename yourself with your first and your last name. And as a reminder, these sessions are recorded. So we'll wait until 7.02 to actually start because I think there is a class just before this one. So we'll allow a few minutes to make the transition. So 7.02 would be our start time. I think your speaker is off. If you were talking to us, Dr. Ford. Yes, thank, thank you. I, we have one more minute, one more minute. One more minute. Go ahead and be placing your names and your campus in the chat. Get uh, and turn your cameras on and rename yourself with your first and last name. We were gonna give everyone to 702. So we have one more minute. All right, it's 702. Good evening to everyone. Good to see everyone. We can't hear you again, Dr. Ford. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so a little commercial. Can you hear me now? So good evening to everyone. Um, good to see each of you. Go ahead and type your name and your campus in the chat. Ensure that your cameras are on and remain on. If you need to step away, place a message in the chat to me. You don't have to send it out to everyone. And ensure that you rename yourself with your first and your last name. And just as a reminder, these sessions are recorded and they are previewed. So just to give you all of that um, housekeeping information. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We're down to week five. Our agenda will include reviewing the notes and, and just making sure that we understand those concepts from the notes. I do have a few videos as we talk about the concepts that we'll watch. We will actually go over quiz three. We will work on the HESI prep assignment. You know, that's a large assignment that's due in week nine. And so the plan was, for, of course, for you to work at your own speed, but for sure, each week, make sure that you include and fill out the parts that we are actually covering so you won't get behind on that assignment because that's some that assignment is not something that you can just complete in like a day or two. All right. And so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And then the reminders, our house, housekeeping um, things, points, I placed them in the chat so you can refer to those. I am going to share my screen here. Screen. 
So um, these are this is directly from the notes that were placed in the announcements, and I'm just going to just review some of the the points. So we were talking about hospice and palliative care, and you know the goal of of these is to alleviate suffering as much as possible without attempting uh, without attempting to cure. So improving the quality of life that is remaining rather than the quantity. So um, an example would be, you know, is this measure going to prolong the person's life for another five or six years? So that's not the focus. It might, but the focus at that time is just that quality of life, having that person, you know, in as less as pain as possible, maintaining, maintaining that dignity. So improving that quality of life that has to remain. And that is uh, appropriate nursing care that we help take, um, that we help provide for the patient. The goal of all the interventions become focused on the quality of care rather than the quantity. Hosp hospice is the palliative care of terminally ill patients. Usually the prognosis is they have been told they have no more than six months to live. Of course, no one knows a day of the hour. But based up on labs, based up on assessments, head to toe findings, um, based up on responses to treatments that have been tried, they give this prognosis and say, you know, you we think that you have less than um, no more than six months to live. And so hospice is the palliative care that's made available for the um, patients and their family members because they have services that are provided for both the patient and the family member. And here are some examples, physical support, and again, to alleviate as much pain as possible. A person might not be pain-free, but the focus becomes on, you know, alleviating as much pain as possible. So you don't want the person moaning, so they'll, they'll eventually add in pain medications. Usually, if that person's um, appetite has decreased, then the pain medications will be things like patches, or even um, drops, not some medication they would actually have to swallow, but it just all depends on that person. So they wanted to reduce air hunger. So then you would start to see people starting to be put on oxygen. It just depends on if they're gasping for breath or having trouble with that breathing. And of course, these things right here, pain and reducing the air hunger should and could improve their sleep. So the family is uh, provided support as well. You have the chaplains where they actually come in and speak with the family as well as the, the patient. And then this right here, because we are talking about care that's provided for a person that where death seems to be imminent or, you know, pretty soon, then we start talking about the stages of grief. So, you know, we know that the stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And so when you're interacting with your patients and their family members, you want your um, communication to be therapeutic, more so open-ended questions. You want them to be able to express how they're feeling because you, it, you'd be surprised how um, a person can, just as long as they can give voice to what they're feeling and what they're thinking and what they're actually experiencing, it's, it makes the situation so much better most of the time. It might not change the situation, but just because you are asking those open-ended questions and you are, you are allowing them to tell you whatever it is that they're feeling, that they're thinking. And that just makes things um, just so much better with those um, you know, people in those situations. And you too have to become aware of your own beliefs and feelings about death and dying so that you do not project what you feel on to your patient or your family. For example, you may think, well, you may know, well, hey, this person just needs this treatment. You know, it's been proven. If they do this, this person is gonna get better. But the family and the patient has decided not to um, receive the treatment. And then, you know, your actions or your conversations lead to them trying to change their decision. So you want to become aware of your own feelings and also be um, culturally aware of and be respectful of their wishes. And that is also providing the best care for your patient. It seems a little bit different than what we're accustomed to, 
but it, it is also, um, and it's legal, you know, it, it's part of providing that care. Go, it goes back to providing that individualized care for your person. It's not a one size all. You know, like my mom, she says, do everything, no matter what they say, just do everything. But then I have an aunt, she says, hey, if they say this is, death is imminent, don't even worry about utilizing those resources. And so, um, you know, we, um, we will, hopefully we can honor their wishes. And it's, like I say, it's individualized. So you do want to show that mutual respect and gain the trust of your patient and your family members. And then they're more, they would be more forthcoming and having those conversations and expressing what they're feeling. And then also with that, it can help you decide on which intervi interventions are most appropriate for your patient. For example, do you need to, if they make a statement about um, their religion, so do you need to reach out to the chaplain or um, whatever type of, you know, minister that they, um, you know, their faith of what they believe in. So having, establishing that trust helps you to gain more information, which leads to you providing that better care for your person, your patient. Pain, pain control is possible and it is expected. You know, it's nothing more, I guess, nerve wracking than a loved one to come in and see or either hear their loved one in pain. You know, it's one thing to you know see the facial grimacing, but then to hear the moaning, you know, they're moving around. So pain control is expected. And um, like I said, the different routes, they'll, they'll change it up. They're not worried about addiction or de a dependence at this point. So just so that th that person can just get at ease and just seeing the person's loved ones like that, it helps the family to cope with what's really going on. I mentioned already about the different um, routes of the pain medication because you might have to change it just depending on if they're not really um, swallowing like they need to, you would wanna give medication by mouth because they, they, they can get choked, they can aspirate and that's causing harm, but also they're not gonna be able to absorb because you can't get the medication in them if that's the route that you're giving it. So many times you see the, the patches, you see the drops, um, and they may eat, you may even have some uh, medications that are given um, by rectal. Oxygen and suctioning are used for respiratory distress. Many times those secretions build up. And so um, you might see the oxygen um, suctioning at the bedside. You might also see some medication that they give to help, to help dry up those secretions. Sometimes they're dropped. Sometimes it's a... Um, the, the medication escapes me right now, but it's a patch they put usually put behind the ear. It helps dry those secretions up. And that in itself helps with the patient getting the, um, being oxygenated. Of course, we're giving these pain medications. And so we do know why it's helping the patient get at ease that it can cause constipation. So the patients may have a new medication, a laxative. Sometimes meals and foods and things and even, you know, flowers, people tend to bring people flowers and things. And those things may trigger the person being nauseated. And so you can expect um, anti-emetics to be a new medication for the, um, the patient as well. A lot of times the hospice um, companies, they have like what they call standing orders. And they have like a list of orders that if you need then you can go ahead and implement those orders for that person. And most of the times it's things like anti-medics at Zofran or things like that. So mouth care is so important. Mouth care, because a lot of times when a person is having problems with breathing and also absorbing or swallowing the secretions, then the mouth becomes either oversaturated, the secretions are you know, coming from their mouth. So they would need mouth care more frequently than just after meals or before meals. So it might be that you do those things when you actually go in to do your rounds, um, which could be, you know, every one to two hours, it just depends. And then on the flip side, the patient that has the mouth that, you know, they're um, gasping, not gasping for air, but air hunger, where they're having trouble moving that air, they tend to have their mouth open more than usual. 
And so you would have to provide that mouth care for them more frequently. They have developed, they have these swabs. What are those things called? But the swabs sometimes, lemon glycerin, they have um, some little glycerin on there. Some of the swabs are dry and you can um, put the mouthwash on them, but they have different things that you can actually use. But mouth care is a, is a, you know, a big to do in helping maintaining that quality of life, the best quality of life. Uh, maintaining that skin integrity, tur that turn and repositioning. Usually the, per the persons are not going to be feeling, you know, their best. They're not. And so they need us to, um, to ensure that they're being turned. And also sometimes we have to help with the assistance of turning and repositioning them. So they will have a turn schedule. They might have to be put on an air mattress. They have all different kinds of mattresses and things now. Then they have elbow protectors. They have sleeve protectors, different things, just so that we do not add to um, what's already going on with the patient. As death becomes more imminent, um, the, the patient will spend more time sleeping. You know, meals, pretty much, you know, the, the intake is really, really low. Even the urine output, everything tends to slow down. We already talked about the secretions and all of that. It is important, again, to understand your own beliefs and attitudes regarding death um, prior to beginning to work with individuals because you just never know when you will encounter it. And, then, and that is a part of living. That's the end of life. Any questions about that first section? Okay, I have a video here. I'm going to stop sharing and reshare on faith community nursing. Let me stop sharing. And just as a reminder, you all go ahead and place your names in the chat, your campus, ensure that your cameras remain on. If you need to step away, please send a, a message just to me in the chat and make sure that your first and last name is showing. Let's get this pulled up here. Okay, so we just have a um, video here on nursing in the faith community, parish nursing. Um, share. And also just rem remember that these sessions are recorded and, the vi and they are viewed. Okay. And let's hit play. Report today on parish nurses. The growing number of registered nurses on the staffs of churches of many denominations helping people. Can you all hear the video or do I need to turn it up a little bit? Can you all hear it? Let me turn it. I can hear it. Okay. Well, with a combination of physical and spiritual care and helping them navigate the healthcare system. Deborah Potter reports from Elk Grove, Illinois. Many churches hold health fairs, but this blood pressure screening at Queen of the Rosary Roman Catholic Church in suburban Chicago is a little different. It's a regular event organized and run by Diane Tiemann, a registered nurse who's on the church staff. I do um, health education classes. I do blood pressure screenings. I take calls from people that want information about the health care system, about themselves and their health concerns. And she does a lot more. Home visits are an essential part of Tiemann's job as a parish or faith community nurse, helping church members, many of whom are elderly, prepare for doctor visits and surgeries. Listen, listen to your heart. Parish nurses are health counselors and advocates. They do not provide treatment. But there's more to the job than checking vital signs, reviewing medications, and helping people navigate the healthcare system. People just need to be heard and need to be listened to. And as a parish nurse, that's one of the greatest things that we do is be present and just listen. They have to the gym, yeah, right. If, if she doesn't make it to help, I know what it will. She's been great. Parish nursing is one of the fastest growing specialty practices recognized by the American Nurses Association. Registered nurses with at least two years of experience are certified after receiving additional training on how to care for the whole person, 
not just physically, but spiritually. It's a matter of being an integrator of health and um, faith. And for us as parish nurses, we really believe in that spiritual component, how important that is to an individual. And I know when I work with individuals, many a times if spiritually they're not well, it's very difficult for them to become physically well. I mean, the body of Christ. Parish nurses also serve as lay ministers, bringing prayers and sometimes communion to the people they visit. I would have been lost without you. You can't be all in one piece. You know what I mean? Mm. Parish nursing traces its roots back to the 1800s, when religious orders in the U.S. and Europe offered care to the wider community. The modern program was launched 25 years ago by a Lutheran pastor here in Chicago, and it's since spread around the world. Some 15,000 parish nurses are now at work in the United States alone. It started out Christian, but actually we have a lot of Jewish um, faith community nurses. We have some Muslim our crescent nurses, and we also have some that are working in Buddhist communities, Hindu and, and others. Maureen Daniels, herself a former parish nurse, now trains nurses to work in faith communities, looking after the whole person. We're not just our heart or our, our liver, or our kidneys, you know, we have, um, there's the person that's there. And, and part of being a person is that whole dimension of spirit that, that makes us who we are. And you can't break it down into pieces the way we've been doing, you know, it really needs to be, you know, who is this whole person? What is their life about? Yeah, come on and sit there, have a seat. Donna smith Papillo coordinates a network of parish nurses in and around St. Louis. Some work mostly with the poor and uninsured or with young families, but they all share the same sense of purpose. Parish nursing, um, is about the intentional care of the spirit and bringing back in um, for all of us a sense of wholeness that embraces both the mind, the body, and the spirit. And that it's doable for almost all congregations, synagogues, and mosques. Um, it is doable. It's not something that has to be paid, that you can use volunteers, that you can find usually someone who's interested and wants to serve. Most parish nurses, in fact, are unpaid and work part-time. Some, like Diane Tiemann, are paid partly by a church and partly by a hospital where they also serve. Hi, Daniel. My name. On this day, Tiemann has brought the hospitalized parishioner a handmade shawl. It is filled with prayers. Wonderful. And this one was actually made by Jerry. Thank Jerry for me. I will. There are some things a parish nurse can't do, like administer medications or give injections, but they can offer programs other nurses don't, like the Queen of the Rosary knitting group that makes the shawls, Dear Lord, bless my hands, and praise for those who will receive them. Tiemann also works with other faith communities, setting up events like this labyrinth walk at a nearby Methodist church. I really feel like when people walk the labyrinth, it's a mind, body, and spirit experience because it not only makes you relaxed and stress relief, but for those who regard it as a spiritual tool, it really helps you to build your relationship with God. Tiemann is not a member of the Catholic Church where she works, although some parish nurses are. Either way, experts say the best predictor of success is the strong support of the pastor. I can't be there for all those people all the time. And uh, so she fills in and parishioners fill in doing that. And uh, she also keeps me apprised when there's a special need or if somebody requests to see me uh, or if someone is, is dying that I can go and see them. I don't know what we would do without Diane. Many parish nurses see their work as more of a calling than a job. For me, it is. Yeah, it is. I, I, feel, um, I feel blessed. And really humble because for me in this job, it really has um, increased my own faith as I work with people. She knows that.
So again, recognize and understand your own beliefs. And then remember, we do have to respect the beliefs of, of, of others. And so as she started the video off, I don't know if you all were thinking about the different levels of interventions as they talked about the, as they talked through the video. So which leads us to our next topic. Any questions about the video in parish nursing before we move on? I did want to um, bring to your attention, religion reflects the traditions and the denominations. Spirituality is the individual's attitudes related to a higher power. And so, as they mentioned that that nurse did not belong to the Catholic um, faith, but she did assist with the different activities. So just keep that in mind. Any questions? All right, so which level of prevention is it? Let me share my screen. So let me hear from you, which, tell me about um, primary prevention. If you were trying to tell someone a definition or if you were writing out a definition of what primary prevention is, what would you tell them? How to prevent before it happens. Anyone else? So Edge, go ahead, Autumn. You you went back on mute. I was just gonna say, like, um, just it's preventative measures. Like it, it, on the paper, it says maybe walking in groups, taking walks, or something like that. Okay. So providing that education to prevent a disease or injury altogether. Okay, so secondary prevention. So if you were giving us a definition of what secondary prevention was, what would you say? Self-screening. So we are screening. And what's that other word that begins with a D that we say that we um, become like little D Detective. detectives. Yes, yeah, so we're screening and detecting. So the things that we do, the interventions for secondary just keep in mind, we're screening for something or we're trying to detect if something is actually there. And then tertiary, if you were giving someone a definition or explaining what kind of preventions those are, what would you tell them? It's treatment for a disease that you already have. Okay, anyone else? I was gonna say the same thing, managing the illness so it can get better. Okay. So the, a disease process or injury is there. And we're trying to maintain it so it doesn't get worse or improve it, or hopefully, you know, it goes away altogether. Great. So now I'm going to place on the screen um, some examples. So apply the definitions and try to select the correct example. Try to select the correct um, level of prevention for the example. Okay, here we go. All right. So the first one is providing meals for families with an ill family member or after the death of a family member. Which level of prevention would we say that it is? For sure. For sure. Do we um, agree? Everybody's agreeing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. So there is a disease process or, or injury there. So that is I'm um, tertiary. So let's look at the next one. Providing a list of community resources for pregnancy testing, HIV testing, or other screening tools. Secondary. Secondary. We have anyone that disagrees thinking of something else? Emily, are you saying something? No. Okay. So we just said screen, we are screening or we are detectives trying to detect. So yes, that is correct. Okay. Let's look at a few more. Providing training for the diabetic diet or low sodium diet for those with diabetes or hypertension. Tertiary. Tertiary. Because we already have that disease process in place. So yes, I agree. Weekly walking groups. That's the primary. Primary. Okay. Ms. Chambers, were you saying something? Did you say something different from primary? I said primary. 
primary. Okay. So we agree. And one more. Teaching signs and symptoms of illnesses for self-screening. Secondary. 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 Okay, you all are rocking. Good. We agree with that. Any questions so far? Okay, so I did. I found a few more videos to help cover our uh, concepts here. Let's see. Pull the next one up. Some of these words I get, um, what do they say? Um, didn't roll off my tongue like I needed to. So here we go. We're going to talk it's about Italianism. And then I have this video for you. So before we look at the video, what is your understanding of it? What do you think it is? Utilitarianism. Trying to cover up the definition so you all can't see it. So give me your paraphrase and put it into your own words. Miss Allen, you're muted. I can't hear you. You're still muted. Not sure if you're trying to. Okay, well, let's go ahead and just look at this. I'm reading it. I'm sorry. Just try to put it in my own words. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I'm we'll sorry. You... Uh -uh, go ahead. We'll give you time. Go ahead and and, and share. Please share. You went back on mute. You were unmuted, then you muted. Okay, so we'll we'll go ahead. I was ahead. trying to pull the word back up on my phone because you have went to the next screen. Okay, okay. Well, we'll we'll come back to you. So go ahead and get your um definition ready for us. But we'll just watch this little short video here. Utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is an ethical theory that determines right from wrong by focusing on outcomes. It is a form of consequentialism. Utilitarianism holds that the most ethical choice is the one that will produce the greatest good for the greatest number. It is the only moral framework that can be used to justify military force or war. It is also the most common approach to moral reasoning used in business because of the way in which it accounts for costs and benefits. However, because we cannot predict the future, it's difficult to know with certainty whether the consequences of our actions will be good or bad. This is one of the limitations of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism also has trouble accounting for values such as justice and individual rights. For example, assume a hospital has four people whose lives depend upon receiving organ transplants, a heart, lungs, a kidney, and a liver. If a healthy person wanders into the hospital, his organs could be harvested to save four lives at the expense of one life. This would arguably produce the greatest good for the greatest number, but few would consider it an acceptable course of action, let alone the most ethical one. So, although utilitarianism is arguably the most reason-based approach to determining right and wrong, it has obvious limitations. Okay, so Ms. Allen, would you paraphrase for us what does your talentarism actually means? Or someone else. Also, she you all can jump in and help Ms. Allen. Um, I was just gonna say, like based off the definition and what I just was listening to, um, I would think it would mean um the best way to improve the well-being of everyone. Um, like in the community, like to bring them together and try to establish some type of, um, or maybe like a group or maybe a community of people that um, that are sought out and from like to sought out like um, I don't know like different things to help everyone as a whole instead of doing like individualized. Okay. 
something like that. I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to add in? So she's saying the greatest good for the most. So your intervention is focused on not just on that one person, but the entire community. And then sometimes those interventions might not include everyone, but if it's for the greater good of the most, then you move forward with that intervention. Anyone else? So basically like COVID, when everybody went on lockdown to keep it from spreading, Exactly. A good, a good example. Looking back, was it the better thing to do to do the lockdown for everybody, for everything, or should it have been done in, you know, in, you know, pots and different little communities? But yes, that's a good example that they thought the greater, you know, to protect, preserve life and the quality of life. They thought, hey, let's just shut the entire thing down. That's a great example. Anyone else? Is it kind of like a balancing act? Like if this, like this decision and how good it would be almost kind of like when you're spending money, what you can get like more bang for your buck kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, so when you become that charge nurse, that DON or that person, even like that administrative type um, nursing, you have to decide, you know, do we buy this product? Do we buy this type bed? You know, is this bed, you know, what are the reviews of these beds tearing up, you know, and after having them for only a year, because you, you're faced with this budget. So again, you're still looking at the greater good for the most, and the most is your, um, your budget and the facility, because if the, the, the money that you're spending outweighs the money that they're taking in, how is that facility going to flow? And then where are the people so if the facility is not there? you know, to provide those services. So good. On a whole different side, you look at it from the finance, the finance part, the budgeting part. Anyone else? I think I, I kind of look at it like um, if I go to the hospital and I'm ill or I'm, I'm like in a bad car accident or something like that. And I have a, I'm a donor, but I, it's other people in the hospital that can, several more people in the hospital that can survive from probably a ligament from my knee, my heart, my retina, something like that. They may not save me because I could save probably seven or eight other people. Am I looking at that right? That is unethical. That should that should be not what actually happened. So if you go in and but it's um, for the greater good. No, not, okay. not for the okay. second, not first of all, we have to do no harm to the person initially. Okay. Now they say, hey, you know, if they determine that all um, measures have been taken and they see that there is no, that death is imminent, death is pretty much close, then they will. But the first thing that they're gonna do is you know, exhaust all means for you. They are not going to not, we should not not provide treatment for someone that we can provide treatment for and that they might be, um, you know, responsive to that treatment so that we can, you know, provide organs and things for other people. No, that's unethical. That's illegal. That's, that's not what we should do. Not that, but thank you for sharing that. No, that's um malpractice and all kind of, uh, yeah, that's just not good. Now, but like I say, after, you know, they determine that, you know, that death is imminent, they have done all that they can do. And usually when that happens, they have another, it's not just one doctor that can say, hey, we, you know, we've done everything. Let's go approach the family for organ donation. They they're um they have to have a second and some in some places have to have a third person to eat, actually sign off on it, and then they actually have a checklist of things that they are supposed to do different type of tests. Like for example, if your person your patient is on a ventilator and they say, well, hey, you know, death is pretty much imminent. We're not seeing any responses to the treatment. You know, we're thinking that you know the end is pretty much near. Then they have things that they have to do you know, legally and ethically to say that they've done everything. And then they do have that conversation with the family members, you know, because once death actually takes place, you know, is this something, if the person don't, don't already have a living will 
or already deemed an organ donor already, then they do have that conversation. Okay, any other comments? Okay, thank you all for sharing. Just uh, one, two, three more um, videos here of some concepts, and then we're gonna move on into our quiz. Just as a reminder, for the remainder of our time, we do have to review quiz three, and then we're gonna work on your HESI prep assignment. Just to let you know where we at, where we are at with our agenda. Okay. Deontology. Deontology is an ethical theory that uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. It is often associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant believed that ethical actions follow universal moral laws, such as don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Deontology is simple to apply. It just requires that people follow the rules and do their duty. This approach tends to fit well with our natural intuition about what is or isn't ethical. Unlike consequentialism, which judges actions by the results, deontology doesn't require weighing the costs and benefits of a situation. This avoids subjectivity and uncertainty because you only have to follow set rules. Despite its strengths, rigidly following deontology can produce results that many people find unacceptable. For example, suppose you're a software engineer and learn that a nuclear missile is about to launch that might start a war. You can hack the network and cancel the launch, but it's against your professional code of ethics to break into any software system without permission. And it's a form of lying and cheating. Deontology advises not to violate these rules. However, in letting the missile launch, thousands of people will die. So, following the rules makes deontology easy to apply. But it also means disregarding the possible consequences of our actions when determining what is right and what is wrong. Okay, so who's going to put dentology in their own words and tell us all about it? So you have a facility that you are working for. When you come in, you know, they go over your job description. They go over the rules, you know, mm -hmm. the regulations that that facility has established. So that guides what you do from day to day. So, but like you mentioned, um, like she mentioned in the video, doing your day to day and following the rules, you come up on, you stumble up on that, you know, a coworker is, you know, going into the system and getting private information on a, a patient. And, you know, they're, I don't know, they're selling it or, or whatever they're doing with it. They're looking in a patient's record that they do, that they're not taken care of. So that is illegal. So with you knowing that you there, um, so do you go to that person yourself? Depends on what that facility's rules are, policies and regulations, you are more than likely you're supposed to follow the chain, report it to your supervisor and then go from there. So dentology is having those rules to guide what you do and don't do. And then sometimes you do run into that, that gray situation where it's like, oh my goodness, this is a, a bad thing is happening. What do I do? So your immediate action in following that policy or procedure will guide you to you know, what you need to do. And then, like I said, if it's something on that level, the example that the, um, the video gave, then I'm sure, you know, who's ever, you know, in charge will decide, you know, hey, you know, I'm going to revise the rule right now and, you know, we're going to do take this approach. But for sure, if you run up on, you know, things happening that's going to cause, you know, harm to someone there, you know, there are ways that you should. <coughs> Any other comments on dentology? <coughs> we have those rules that guides what we do from day to day, you know, at our facilities and places that we work at. Anyone else want to share comments of how you think um, of what you think dentology is? Give an example. Have anyone ran into a situation that was, and you don't have to call names or anything, where you know something happened, but the rule 
prevented you at that moment in time from like taking immediate action against what was going on. Emily, are you saying something? Are you trying to share? No. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move on. Just Today we'll talk about the ethical principle, non maleficence It is commonly known as do no harm. And it simply means that each decision the physicians make must produce more good than harm. In certain scenarios where doing harm is unavoidable, you have to minimize the harm. For example, a chronic diabetes patient who is uncontrolled and a gangrenous complication developed in their foot. And the surgical consultant recommended cutting off the foot. This is a scenario of unavoidable harm. Now to practice non-maleficence, the treating physician has to take out only the infected part and minimize the degree of amputation. In certain scenarios, non-maleficence can overweigh autonomy, such as a TB patient who refuses treatment. In this scenario, the patient has to take the treatment even by force to protect the community. Basically, in every decision the physician makes, they have to overweigh the risks and benefits. In the first example, the risk of septicemia and bacteremia is very serious, and this could, could lead to death. And the benefit is stopping the infection from spreading. In the second example, the risk of infecting the entire community the patient lives in is very serious. And the risk of the patient's own demise is also serious. <coughs> Although overriding autonomy is not something that is taken lightly, the benefits clearly overweigh the risks. And here's a small quiz. Try to see whether or not non maleficence principle was practiced here. I guess we're gonna pause it. So what do you all think? So read the scenario. In the emergency department, the treating physician misdiagnosed a patient who had a ruptured appendix. As a result, the patient was admitted to the ICU and compensated for the misdiagnosis. The ER physician apologized and agreed to take a guideline review. Was non malfeasance was it practice or not? What do you think? Do no harm. I think it was practiced. And then tell us why you think. What's your why? Because they didn't actually like go through with the surgery. It was just a simple like misdiagnosis. And the surgeon took the steps to like correct that misdiagnosis. Okay. Let me hear from someone else. Was it practice or not? And then your why. Let me hear from someone else. Come on. So do we think that this physician, you know, just maliciously, you know, assess the patient just says, oh, just, just treat them for a cold. Oh, let's just treat them for, you know, whatever. And just overlooked, just outright, just overlooked. Or did that physician, you know, based upon the assessment, the different labs, um, just really thought it was something else. And it just so happened to be not what the doctor um, actually thought initially. Do we think that does that do we think that actually happens that people get misdiagnosed initially they think is this all the, time. all the time go ahead well I think that there's not a lot of information here because we don't know what they were diagnosed with yeah so I would say it was not practiced because doctors are human 
nurses are human and we miss stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, there's so much in a ruptured appendix that can that can be other applications that can be that can happen. So I would say that the non it was not practice. I mean, I think that he made the best diagnosis that he could make. Based on the information he had. Right. Based on the information. And then again, we don't have we don't have a lot of information like what did he what did he um treat them with or what did what kind of treatment was there? So just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, uh, Ms. Catherine, you were saying he did the the best with the information that he had, whatever that information was. Right. Okay. So yeah. it was practice. Yeah. Okay. No, it was. Yeah. So he, yes, it was practice. Thank you all for sharing. And we're going to just go to our last video here. Let me refer back to my notes here. We are right here. Make sure we went over. We went over the prevention. Talked about our theories. Okay. And then um, caretaker, uh, caretaker burnout. And that includes you as a nurse. In the event that, you know, if you're that hospice nurse or that I see you nurse and you, you know, you say, this is just beginning to just wait on me. You know, day after day, you know, I'm involved with, you know, this type of stress and we're losing patients and we're just, and you're just getting weighed down. You know, your it is your duty to say, hey, to seek, the, seek out your supervisor and to, you know, step back. You may need to change um, duty assignments because first, your duty first is to always provide that standard of care for every patient, no matter what the circumstances. So when you feel that you're getting weighed down by the situation or, you know, something um, outside of your work assignment, it is your responsibility to have that um, conversation with your supervisor so that you can, you all can see what some other things that you might can do within that facility. The Code of Ethics, it describes the ethical values and obligations for nurses in practice. And I do actually have a um, video on that one that has some questions at the end so we can look at that in more detail. And remember, you're that advocate. You are acting in that client's best interest. You're like that lifeline. No matter if their beliefs do not line up with yours, still you are there to advocate and ensure that that patient, that person, um, everything is within their best interest. You know, when they're signing consent, you know, giving permission, making sure, for example, if the person does not speak English and the consent is in, you know, English and they're not understanding it, they speak Spanish or some other language, ensuring that that consent is um, interpreted or given in um, a format that they actually, you know, can read and understand because you want your patients to make that informed decision. So first, you know, it should, you know, have a self-talk, be real about what you value and how you think and view things, but do understand that you have to respect the beliefs of others. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to speak up because you would think, well, they already know this person don't speak English. So why are they, you know, not providing the alternate menu so they can select a, a meal that they want. Why aren't they not, you know, providing materials that they can um, actually read and understand or an interpreter? So you might have to be the person that speak up because you are there, you're the advocate for that um, person. Okay, let me stop sharing for just a moment and we'll look at this last. Um, video covering our content, then we will switch and go to review quiz three and then our HISI prep assignment. So that's where we are it on our agenda. And just as a reminder, remember, place your name and your campus in the chat. If you have to uh, walk away from class for just a moment, put, you know, send me a message in the chat. Remember, your cameras are supposed to be on and these sessions are recorded. Okay, so the last video that we're going to watch before we move on into the other items on our agenda is ethical principles in nursing.
is let me share here. Hey there, it's Christine from Nurse in the Making, and today we're going to talk about ethical principles. This is a very common topic tested on the NCLEX and in your fundamentals class. So let's look at the seven ethical principles you need to know. The first uh -oh. If you're a college student like me, especially, you need Grammarly in your life. Grammarly is a digital writing point. assistant, and it's super easy. The first one is autonomy, and this is respecting a patient's values and beliefs. A patient has the right to choice and self-determination. It's the idea that a patient holds the right to make their own health care decisions and has the right to make all choices in their care. You can remember this by the memory trick, autonomy think all by myself. I have the right to make my own decisions. An example of autonomy would be a patient refusing treatment because every patient has the legal right to refuse a surgical procedure or treatment if they are deemed medically stable. In other words, they have autonomy over themselves and their healthcare choices. The next one is beneficence. This is always doing good for the patient and acting with compassion. So nurse should always choose the good for each patient. You can remember this because beneficence looks like benefit and benefit means good. An example of this would be holding a patient's hand who is on hospice care and wants someone close to them. We're doing good for our patient and acting with compassion. The next one is fidelity. This is where the nurse will remain loyal and faithful in their actions and care. They are keeping their promises and providing safe, well-intentioned care. You can remember this by the memory trick, fidelity, think faithful. An example of fidelity in healthcare would be telling your elderly patient you will bring them to the bathroom in 15 minutes, and you act faithfully to your statement. You're not just saying things to leave the room. Again, fidelity is being loyal and faithful in your actions. Accountability. The nurse will take responsibility for all their actions. They are accountable for their errors or mistakes. You can remember this by the memory trick, accountability, think I'm accountable for my actions. An example of this would be when a nurse makes a medication error, they're gonna take responsibility for it and not try to hide it. Again, we're accountable for our actions. The next one is justice. Just means fair. And justice means equal care will be delivered to all patients. You can remember this by the memory trick, I just want fair care for all. An example of justice is caring for each patient the same, regardless of their background, socioeconomic status, gender, ethnicity, or history. Again, equal care will be delivered to all. The next ethical principle is non-maleficent. Another way to say this is do no harm. The nurse should not inflict any harm on any patient. This could include intentional or unintentional harm. You can remember this by the memory trick. Non means none and mal means bad. So in other words, do no bad or do no harm. An example of non-maleficence is when a nurse stops administering a medication that is known to be harmful. Another example is not administering aspirin to a patient with a known allergy to aspirin. This is why you as a nurse should do multiple checks before administering to avoid a medication error that could harm your patient. Again, this is intentional or unintentional harm. The next ethical principle is veracity. This is being entirely honest with the patient at all times. You can remember this by the memory trick, veracity think very honest. An example of this is simply not lying to your patients. If a patient is taking a medication with a known adverse side effect and the patient asks, does this medication have side effects? You as the nurse need to be very honest and tell them the known side effects. Okay, let's do a practice question to test your knowledge. Which of the following is the correct understanding of nursing ethical principles? Pause the video and comment your answer below. 
Justice is telling the client the truth that the medication can cause a rash. Autonomy is requiring the patient to have an advanced directive. Fidelity is staying with a patient during their death as promised. Beneficence is not telling the client they have cancer because that was the family's wishes. Justice is telling the client the truth that the medication can cause a rash. Telling the client the truth is veracity, not justice. Remember, veracity think very honest. So this one is not correct. Autonomy is requiring the client to have an advanced directive. Requiring is not autonomy. This is a tricky one because, well, the NCLEX is tricky. Having an advanced directive is a patient's right, but requiring a patient to have one is taking their autonomy away from them. So this is not correct. Fidelity is staying with a patient during their death as promised. Yeah, this sounds like fidelity. Remember, fidelity think faithful. This is the correct one, but let's look at option four to make sure. Beneficence is not telling the client they have cancer because that was the family's wishes. This is taking away the patient's autonomy. Beneficence means doing good, but this statement takes away the patient's autonomy because they have the right to know their medical diagnoses. So again, this is um, when you're doing, you're taking your test and I'm just moving forward here for your next exam. Think about those keywords. Like if there's a one word that makes the statement incorrect, like going back up here to where it says autonomy, the word required, you know, they would have taken that out. You know, autonomy is just informing the client about, you know, an advanced directive. But when it says it is required, then that one word makes the whole thing incorrect. So just think about those keywords and terms that are in the question or the scenario and also in the answer choices when you're selecting your um your correct answer for your on your exams. For more daily NCLEX practice questions like this, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Let's do a quick review of the seven ethical principles. Autonomy means the right to make your own decisions. Remember, autonomy think all by myself. Beneficence means doing right or doing good. Remember, that sounds like benefit, which is a good thing. Fidelity means remaining loyal and faithful. Fidelity think faithful. Next is accountability, which means responsible for all my actions. Think accountability, I am accountable for my actions. Justice means equal care. Remember, I just want fair care for all. Non-maleficence means do no harm. Non means none and now means bad. Last but not least, we have veracity, which means remaining honest at all times. Veracity, think very honest. Okay, so we're going to pause for a two-minute break. Let me put a timer on. When we come back, we're going to actually go over quiz three. So you can either, you know, jot the answers down and or you can answer it if you're able to as we go through it. So put my timer on for two minutes. The next thing on our agenda is to review quiz three. Just let me turn my timer on. Feel free to turn your camera off for just a moment. Um, go get you some water, use the restroom and return. See you in two.
one more minute and then we'll get started. But I did want to just share with you all. Don't forget if you are needing to, um, you know, review your exam or tutor, get tutoring for the next upcoming exam. I did post a couple of dates and times. If those times and dates do not work, please send an email so that we can coordinate some time so that we can, you know, prepare for the, the next exam. So you can do your very best. So make sure that you put that on your on your agenda. You know, even if you did make the 78% still, if you think you need to, you know, get some additional tutoring, please send an email so we can coordinate some time. All right, 30 more seconds and we'll get started. So quiz three. Now I know some of you all can't pull it up at the same time as your Zoom is up, that's fine, but make sure that you are taking notes and so that you can complete this um, quiz tonight. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Turn your cameras back on and let's get started. So I wanna hear from you all, quiz three, question number one. So we'll give you all time to read through it and let's talk through what we think the answer choice is. So let me hear from you what you think the answer choice is and we'll discuss it and come to a conclusion and move on to the next question. So remember when you're reading the questions, consider your population, who, what is going on and are they specifically talking about um, a concept, for example, in here, in this question, in this question, we're talking about the concept is primary prevention, not just prevention altogether, but they have singled it down or narrowed it down to primary prevention. So that automatically eliminates, helps you to eliminate some of the answer choices. So, you know, what is going on in the, in the scenario? You know, who, and then is there a specific concept or they just, or are they just talking in general? Would it be discussed where and how to obtain ongoing contraception? Uh, contraception. Okay, do we agree with Ms. Um, I, do. I was thinking the same thing, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Discuss providing education, tomato, tomato. So don't let the words change, you know, up. And I agree, it is discussed. That's just are we doing quiz right now? Yeah, we're on quiz three. We want to quiz three. And if you're able to mark them as we go through, you can. Otherwise, just make sure that you're writing the answers down on the sheet of paper. And then just make sure you see the concept. So like the I, I can't hear. There's a lot of noise behind. Uh, make sure that you're that you on mute, everyone. Make sure we're on mute. I don't see. Okay, make sure on mute. Sometimes I'm um, not sure what happens when I little we get unmuted. Okay, but you you all can't hear me, right? You can. Okay, because sometimes yeah. So yeah. So okay. can we go back to question one again? Because I didn't hear anything. Okay. So the school nurse is engaging in a primary prevention program. Which intervention is appropriate? So a test taking strategy or tip is. Who are we talking about in this scenario? What is going on? Is there a specific concept that they're talking about or are we just talking about something in general? So specifically, they're talking about primary prevention. So when you look at your answer choices, you're gonna automatically eliminate things that have to do with a, a disease process that's actually in place or injury. If, we're, if we are detecting something or screening, we can automatically eliminate all those answer choices because we're talking about primary. So the specific concept that we're talking about is primary. So going back to your, your foundation, your background knowledge, as you read the answer choices, you're automatically able to eliminate the answer choices that are incorrect. Okay, and then we said that discuss where and how to obtain ongoing contraceptive was an example of primary. So right, to yeah. something or educate is to get it to model, you're saying the same thing. Yeah, it's a discussed where the, that's right, primary. So why is, yeah. 
Educate on the side effects of antibiotics for gonorrhea incorrect. Because we're it uh, Yeah, they already have a disease, so yeah. that would be tertiary. So mm -hmm. read through the whole answer to us because when you see educate, you automatically think, okay, that's primary. But read the mm -hmm. entire um, answer to us to ensure that is all the way correct that it matches your what you're trying, the concept, which is a concept here is primary prevention. Okay, number two. Is A, continue using condoms. Yeah. I get B. Or prenatal established in the second trimester adoption. Wouldn't it be about the diet? So we have. But she wants to modify her diet, though, right? Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Maintain the usual diet without modifications. But we don't know what her usual diet is. I say A. I think it's A still, yeah. Because remember, it has to be all the way correct. So, yeah, <clears throat> A, continue using condoms with every sexual contact to prevent STDs during pregnancy. Yes. So, maintaining the usual diet without modifications. You know, what was the diet? You know, what is the, what is the usual diet? They didn't say. So yeah. if it's kind of vague and if you don't have all the information, you can kind of eliminate, you can eliminate those answer choices. So we're saying A for number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, number three. Oh, I don't have all the answer choices up there. Hold on, you all. Let me stop sharing. I was trying to move it down so that you all could see all four answer choices. Give me just a moment. Small, it won't go down. Okay, so we're on question number three. I think it's number D, observe the emotional and behavioral problem. Yeah, it's D too. Yeah, D. Yeah, it's D. D or C? Okay. You have to, you have to observe first if they have yeah, any issues and then you can refer. Yeah. Okay, so we're we've narrowed it down to D or C. So why is D incorrect? So remember these keywords should be yeah, which one is the base? That's why I feel like a pin so is correct, but it's not of the most priority. Priority. So to have that continual observation, we would need to get that referral because it's going to be, they're going to need services beyond you. So me, you know, you would do this right here, but you're going to need that ongoing. So you have to obtain that referral for mental health counseling and services. And then we can observe. Exactly. And you can assess, you can even do the family history and all, and then teach the stress reduction techniques. Mm -hmm. You can do actually do all of those. Yeah. But if someone has witnessed a violent crime, you know, you want to go ahead and get those other resources. You want to go ahead and make that, that connection. That Next counseling work. first. Yes, coordinate those services and resources for that person first. Mm -hmm. right. so three is C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's look at number four. Is 
screening for depression. A. 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 So that, that specific concept is secondary prevention. So you can automatically eliminate anything that tertiary or tertiary. So yes, we all agree up on that one. So A. A for number four. Stop sharing for just a moment. Let me move five down so you can see all the answer choices at one time. And we are on number five. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, C. is it apnea? C, yeah. apnea. What is your why? Explain to us why you selected that one. Um, your ABCs. A, A, B, C, yeah, ABCs. And it depress your respiratory mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Airway breathing and circulation. Yes, that's one of those side effects. You all were spot on. That didn't take you long at all. So you all are making those connections. You're automatically um, going back on your prior knowledge and your understanding of the concepts. You know, oxycodone, it slows things down. Yes, C, good. So let's look, so number five is C, Abby. So let's look at number six. C, C, C. C. Are you and um, I heard C and B. So C. are we are you saying C and B or C? C. I think it's C. Are we saying D is or B is in Bob? C is in Charlie. C is in Cat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the C. I, I, so, C. I can't understand that. Look, but I didn't hear anyone else say I thought they said D is in Danny. Did I do that? <laughs> okay, we know it is. Okay, all right. I stand correctly. I did not hear that correctly. We are saying <laughs> Okay, that is arranging the addict led support groups to promote recovery because there is something, a disease process, an injury that's already there. We're trying already to, is there. Yes, we're trying to maintain it or help improve it. Yes, great. I am sorry, I heard that all wrong. <laughs> But I was, you know, I was gonna ask the why. Come on, explain it to us here. Let me see. I don't know. I caught myself making them small, changing the font so what you can all see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're on question number seven. Question number seven. So if you can't um, fill it in while we're on together, you know, we'll give time at the end for you to complete your attestation and also to go in and then complete your quiz too. So just hold on, make sure you're here for the conversation and understanding the concepts. So, okay, here we go. We're on question number seven. A. A. Will we hear we hear anything else? Yeah, it's A. I think it's A. So why why are you saying it's A? Everything else is causing harm. I know. Or I'm potential. Tennis. Good, 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 good. Yes. And sometimes that happens. You, I mean, because um, inserting a Foley catheter, that is a sterile procedure. It is so easy to break sterility. It is on you to say, no, 
Sterility has been broken. My sterile field has been, you know, um, compromised. I need to go get another kid. And a lot of times yes. when you know that you're doing those sterile procedures, you have those extra supplies, not in the room, but like just outside of the room that, so it could save you some time because things happen. That person moved that leg or, you know, you can do your hands the wrong way or something and you break sterility. You, um, that sterile is no longer is contaminated. So it's on you to not, not cause any harm. Good. So number seven is A, you have to stop what you're doing and go get a new kit. That's how it goes. All right, number eight. <clears throat> um, is it notify healthcare provider of the need for additional pain management? So let me just hear your thought process behind it. Why did you select that? Why are you thinking that's the correct answer? Um because we're not gonna add a non-pharmacolic pain medica medication because they're not gonna have a risk to addiction. Um, and we're not gonna cancel the family that that they're gonna have a pain-free death. And we don't remove the fentanyl patch and apply a fresh one in the same location. We do not do that. This is the hospice, hospice plan. Yeah. Because they're more focused on the, pain really. The pain, yeah. Being comfortable. Yeah. So, yeah, the patient needs to be comfortable. That's like the number one thing. Yeah, you all went through the answer choices. You eliminated. Say, no, you know, we we can apply a new patch. But Not in the same location, though. Not the same location. You know, because something could happen to that. It could fall off or whatever you need to, but not the same location because we're supposed to rotate sites. So great, great, great. And that keyword was hospice. Consider what is going on. Is your setting a homeless shelter? Is it hospice? And then that narrows your focus on what your intervention should be. So yes, correct. Number eight is B. Great, great, great. Okay. So number nine. I think it's D as in dog. Yeah, it's D. D as in dog. Mm -hmm. Because it's an open-ended question. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to expand and elaborate that that's going to make them want to talk out when you ask them that and the other ones is just like they, they don't even make sense mm -hmm. I think it's B as in boy talk us through it why do you think that because you want to encourage the patient um, to like reach out to their pastor or whatever makes them comfortable. He has a dog because you want to always ask them open-ended questions when they are um, going. He wants to know their thought process behind it. We're torn between B and D. I think it's D. It's D. Yeah. Yes, it's D, yeah. I say D. So why are you saying B is not the correct answer? So what if you, if don't, know religion? Religion. Yeah, you don't know their religion? Yeah, you don't know religion. That's just like saying I'm gonna call a chaplain up here to say, come pray with you. I don't know if that's something that you're desiring. So you would ask them open the question like they were saying previously, to get a better idea of what this person is going through and why they feel the way they do. So we do have that keyword. The keyword is. Yeah, uh, the keyword is God, but that doesn't necessarily that's mean Christian that they, religion. If if it's God, this is tricky. Refer to their God. Know every background there. We don't know. The person could be. Is it not B because it says pastor and you're assuming that their religion is a pastor? Because aren't there other words instead of like pastor for um, someone who guides you with God? Could that be like a key word? God yeah. is a key word. And the answer choice is B, but you all are correct. And in, in that this is an open-ended question 
And in that pastor, you might not should have used pastor, might should have used, um, what's another word we can use? Um, Chaplain. Religious supervisor. Or, yes, that would have been a better wording for this. But the key word is God. So we're narrowing it down to, you know, religion. So yes. Do you have a pastor? So what's the word? B. 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 B as a boy. B as in boy, yes. Okay. Yes, B as in boy. But yes, the open-ended question, you do want that, but you have that keyword here. And so if pastor was left out, B would have been me a, a um, religious person, would have been a better way to say that. But this right here, B is the correct answer. So yes, I would be making the connections. So we would have had a second answer choice. What makes you think you're being fun? Would have been. been the, um, All right. So number 10. Kingdom A. A. Mm -hmm. A. I am only hearing A. Anyone else? Are we sticking with A? Our story. Okay. Yes, it is A. It is A. So number 10 is A. Okay. And so what we have left to do is for you to submit your quizzes and complete your attestation and then you work on your HESI um, prep assignment. I do know some of you all say that you can't do the submit the quiz while you're on Zoom. So what we do is for the last, we have what, 30 minutes left. So let's divide the time out because you have to complete your attestation. So that'll take about five, five to seven minutes. And then submit your quiz about five to seven minutes too. So about 10 minutes. So let's go ahead for um, 20 minutes, open your HESI prep assignment. And in the last 10 minutes of class, we will give you time to, if you need to log off to complete those two things, which is your quiz and your attestation. That's going to be at the end. So now let's move to the HESI prep assignment. And what you're supposed to be doing is completing. Go ahead and filling in for sure those things, the concepts that we have covered. So I'm going to just put you in the breakout rooms, maybe like two people in a room. And just so that you all can just hear each other's, you know, method, ideas of how to complete this assignment, you know, what you have for it. You have some, you all had some great ideas the last time um, that you all shared with each other. And then if you're needing to be in a room by yourself, just send me a message and then I'll just put you in a different breakout room. But for now, we're just going to put you all two, no more than three people in a breakout room. And what you are working on is this HESI prep assignment. So I'm going to open up the breakout rooms. So no, this is, you're not assigned. This is not like a group assignment. This HESI prep is just you're given time in class to just work in a group to, um, you know, just hear each other's ideas. And, you know, you all can, you know, share and help each other with this. So this is not a group assignment. It's just so we're just putting you in small groups to, you know, work in, in this setting so that you can, um, you know, share ideas and concepts. So here we go. How many do we have here? And then after the 20 minutes is up, we, and of course, I come around to the rooms um, as I did before. I come around, just hear what you're saying and answer questions. And then the last 10 minutes, We'll give you time to complete your quiz and your attestation. So here we go. And create. So accept the invitation. I think I don't have any more than two in a room, so. Catherine, I put your message in the chat. 
So I'm not sure who this is, but it says Zoom user. So I do need you to name yourself. Ms. Wells, are you there? Okay, and Catherine, I'm just going to mute myself because I do want to give everybody time to just, you know, this time in class too. So I'm just going to. Focus on mouth care. Yeah, a mouth care and like said, um, all that uh, we just saw that. Yeah, uh, like air hunger because mm -hmm. they need. Um, with them and their family, um, to communicate with them and their family to make sure we are respecting their needs. You have any questions about anything? Yeah, are we talking about the, this topic you gave us, like the influenza? Uh, no, no, no. I... You're working on that's your group assignment, that one, but you're working. Let me share. Yeah, that... yeah because yeah, I got a little bit confused about that. Uh, I didn't. So, this is what you should be working on now this assignment right here, this HESI prep assignment. Uh -huh. Sorry, give me a. Uh huh. So as we, you know, because it's a huge assignment, as we go mm -hmm. along the different concepts it, that we cover, go ahead and fill them. I, I know you talked that, but I was looking for it in the, in the what in the assignment is I didn't see it there. Okay, let me go to let me go to the course room. Let me see, can I find it? I think it's week oh, nine. Okay. I think it's week nine. But let me look to make sure. 
I know I emailed one of the students, she didn't respond. I couldn't find it. Okay, let me just make sure. I think it's week nine. Yes, so I'm gonna share my screen here and here it is. Yeah, week nine, I can see the assignment, but now I can see we are supposed to submit it, but now the assignment, I can't pull it. Okay, download this document right here. This is where the document is. Hold on. So you go in week nine. Let me go back mm -hmm. out. Okay, let's go back up here. Okay, right here where it says HESI prep assignment. Click mm -hmm. that right there. And then download this document. So click yeah. there, the document should pop up. Now, if I need to send it oh. to you, in your um, I see uh, so if I, I see it, yeah you see it okay mm -hmm. yes so it, like and like and then we are supposed to work with we're supposed to work all of it or everything you're supposed to individually fill in that whole form and turn it in uh -huh. by December 5th but because it's such a huge assignment I'm giving mm -hmm. time in class to try to get some of it done so, I know you gave us into groups and I had written something down, but I couldn't pull out this assignment. I, I have a note what, what I was supposed to write in our group. Yes, now that's a different assignment that you're talking about. That's the group assignment. The HESI prep is not a group assignment. Okay. I, just, I got you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the okay, group I assignment is right here in week seven. Mm -hmm. I see. I put, the group assignment, I already, I already did that. Okay. But yes, HESI is a huge assignment. So I'm just making sure, you know, just allow mm -hmm. some time in class to get it done and also to talk to your other classmates just to get some ideas of how to complete it. Now, do you want me to put you in oh. a group with someone, in a room with someone so you can talk to someone? Because Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because what happens is the computer just generates and puts you all where they want to, but I can move you to another room. Okay, no problem. But your yeah, next Do you have any questions? Do you all know where to find the HESI prep assignment form? Yes, we got all of that. I was just researching some stuff. Okay. All right. So I'll just move on to the next room. You doing okay? Do you want me to move you in a room so you, you can ask your classmates some information, you know, about some questions or anything? Are you okay in this group by yourself? Um, yeah, I was with somebody, but I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I'm okay by myself. Okay. So you the the HESI prep assignment is in module is in week nine. And if you open that assignment up, the document is there at the top. Okay. It is not a group assignment, but it's because of it's such a huge assignment. I'm just trying to give you all some time doing class to, you know, to start on it and get it done because it's a huge assignment. Okay. The, the group assignment is the week seven. That's the group assignment. Okay. 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 And then how did you do with your exam? You did okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go on to another room. Okay. Y'all okay? Do you have any questions or concerns? Are you all okay? Yes, we're fine. Okay, just let me see how much time you all have left. 
So just giving you all time in class to get some of all the things that you all have to get done. I'm done. So we have nine more minutes. And then the last 10 minutes of class will give you time to put the quiz in and then to do the as a station. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. How you doing, Miss Hill? You have any questions for me? I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm talking and talking and talking. I'm so sorry. I was saying, when is this due, actually? Hesse, the Hesse assignments do week nine. And so let me go to the, let me look at the actual date. Let me go to the course room. Now I printed that out. Can I just, what? can I write everything on there and then submit it or what? I think it will allow you to upload it. It should. Let's look at it. So it's December 5th. Help. Oh, well, hold on. You're not, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Let me go back. It is due week nine. will it allow usually it allows you to let me go from the student view see how it looks when you look at it okay mm, i'm not seeing where it allows me to submit it it's not like a full link or anything let's see let me stop Usually, it has, okay, Lee student in view. Hmm. Download this document. Hmm. Usually, it is the where you can upload a link or a document. <clears throat> and I'm not okay. Let me go look one other place here. So let me look at the grades and see. Let's see. This is the Hesse print in module number nine. Okay, Hesse prep assignment. Let's look at it. I think when you click um, submit, is I but I'm not seeing that part. Are you able to? I'm looking at that one in there right now. We can yeah. so. let's see what it looks like when you look at it, and you can share your screen. Okay. Um. um I guess I don't know what I'm doing. I never shared it. Okay, so you would look at the bottom of your screen. In the middle, there's a green button with the arrow going up. It is. Yeah. Okay, click that. Do I hit desktop? And if, if, the, if that's where you want to share, if that's where your thing is, click desktop. But it usually gives you some options and you click whichever thing that you want me to see. Open. I was telling me to open the system for its preferences and all that. And it's, oh, wait. I need to click this. Okay. There we go. Okay.
Now so that now I can share it. So can you see it? Not yet. Right now I'm still just looking at you and I. Um desktop share. Okay, now it's doing something now. Okay, there we go. So okay. click your the course room, whichever tab, the course room that is that you have open. Oh, right here. Okay. Um, go to modules. Modules. Yes, and then go down to week nine. Okay, no class. Here we go. Modules. Man, why you just taught me some? I didn't know I could do all this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you your screen and click on that. Okay. okay, yes. When you click start the assignment. Oh, right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's that should give you the option to upload a file if you're gonna fill it out and you can take pictures of it or oh yeah, like how I do any okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So wait a minute. All so we do bioterrorism does that we do all this right yeah it's a huge assignment i see why you're saying we need to start now mm -hmm. okay so or that paper that you gave us i printed up do we put everything in that or do we write it out on a different paper if you're able to type in it because if you download it as a word document you can type your stuff right on that form and save it and upload that form but if, oh okay yeah, yes you can actually yeah, I got mm-hmm Okay, I'll do that then. Yes, it's it's huge. It's a huge oh, assignment. Yeah. I didn't realize it was this much. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I need to start this immediately. Yes, yeah, so you can, and now you just click stop sharing. Okay. It, the camera is red. It should it should have turned red. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to share so that you can see this document. It is. It's um. It's I got hard. that. I printed it up. That's why I was asking you, like, do I write it all in this or no? I would. I mean, it, it just depends on what you are comfortable with. It, just typing mm -hmm. up your information or if you need to write it, it's going to be up to you. So I can doc. Do you got, you got a Mac computer too? I don't. Oh, okay. I have a my stuff like this. So if I download this particular, um, in my, um, on my computer, I could type on this is what you're basically saying and then exactly. just save it in. Okay, I'll do it that way. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. All right. So let me look at my little timer. We should be probably, I think our time is almost up. But yes, and so that's why I was giving you all time. We've got a minute left. Time in class to just, you know, at least start on it, get the, you know, get it moving and then piggybacking off each other, asking, you know, well, you know, what, how are you approaching it? And, you know, with the content and everything. So. Okay. I start on mass this Sunday. Yes. Cause it's, is not, you can't complete it in yeah, one second. I've just seen it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Are we the only ones left? <laughs> no, they're slowly coming at the breakout room. Okay. Yeah, dude, some of them are still talking in the room. And so, you know, that is a huge assignment. The HESI prep is not a group assignment. It's just a large assignment. It's, it's, it's huge. And so we just give you time, you know, some time in class to kind of talk through the concepts and how to, you know, to approach completing that assignment. Mm hmm and I complete that assignment in one, you know, like one day. It, it's going to take some time. All right. And then oh, okay. that's not due until week nine, which is December 5th. But look at us. We're already in November. Yes. Mm -hmm. So make good use of the time. You know, the few minutes that, you know, got, you know, small amount of time in class, but make good use of it. 
I went around to all the groups. I think I answered everyone's questions. If I have not, you know, please ask now so I can clear things up or, you know. So we do have, we do have a question. So the one that we did last week, um, I know that was like a the group um, project that we were doing. So I did my portion of the paper and I submitted it in the group. So do we submit that paper together or do we all submit it individually? Everyone's going to submit it individually because you have to have a submission in the grade book for group uh, okay. for the project that's in group set that's in week seven. Yeah, you still have to submit it individually, even though you're working together to complete it. So okay. I have okay. a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um. So in regards to that, um. So you said when we have to submit it individually, is that saying like? Say, so say if like everybody is like typing on one paper and just sending their stuff in, do it have to be, can we send in the same copy as yeah. individually? Yeah, you're sending in the same. Okay. Everyone, everyone right. in that group should have the same. Yes, because you worked on it as a group, but each person okay. has to have a submission because otherwise the grade book mm -hmm. or the school for attendance will mark you as not attending or mm -hmm. completing the assignment for that week. So yeah, it's interesting. Every person is turning the okay. same thing. Okay. All right. And that's that's week All right. eight, which is not the HESI prep assignment. That's week nine, which is not a group assignment. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions? So at this time, I need you to submit your quizzes and your attestation. You need to complete those. And if you have to log off to do that, please do so, so that that is done and out of your way. So we're not, so you're not missing attendance and then you're not missing getting those points. So at this time right here, complete your quiz and submit it and then turn in your attestation. And for those of you that okay. have to log off, to complete it, you know, you don't have to log back on once you actually get those done. Yes. What'd you I was going to say, if we've already completed it, are we able to log off or no? Yes, you are. If you don't have any other questions and you've completed okay. both of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. good weekend, but make sure it's done. All right. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. All right. Okay. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good night. Miss mm -hmm. Ford, I do want to go over my exam with you. I think I emailed you, but I was still waiting on a response. So do you want me to just email you again or can I set it up right now? I think I, I did respond and I, I think I included the time for tomorrow because you missed the time that we did yesterday and the other day, right? Is that was that you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. I'm not sure. Maybe it was another email, but I was meaning it's a uh touch bases with you on on that on that meeting so yeah. i can't go over my exam okay and i think i like i said i did respond because you said you missed the other two reviews right is that what you said the times didn't work for you was that you no it probably was somebody else okay let's just go to a breakout room real quick so for those okay. of you that are still here go ahead and complete those two things when you're done with her, can I set up my time with you too? Okay, yes. We'll, um, just, so just have a time and a date in mind, at least two. And we'll set that up. Let's see. Move to... I was going to email you, but what are some times that you're, like, I can give you dates and times, but what are times that you're not available? Okay, and so since I think the three of you all have the same question. So on tomorrow, beginning at two o'clock, we have a two o'clock time at two thirty, which will be your time, three o'clock, three thirty, and four. Does any of those times work for you all? If it does, just send me an email and say, "Hey, I want to be on at two p.m." So tomorrow, which is Saturday, I'm hearing something. You all know it's not mine. I don't have anything in the back. Oh, it's probably it's probably mine. Okay. So the times that I have available, if you miss. You know, this week's, and even if you did come, we did meet this week and you want to still meet additional time. So on tomorrow, which is November 5th, 
um, 2 p.m. No, 3 p.m. your time, 3.30, 4 o'clock. So anybody wants to sign up for the 3 p.m. slot? I can do three. Either one is fine with I me. Can, you want three? I can do four. Okay. I'll take, I'll take 3.30. Okay. So I have Mason, Washington, and no, I have Mason, Moody, then Washington. Okay. And we just log on to this Zoom? To this same Zoom, yes. Okay. And this is 3.30 my time or your time, Professor? 3.30 your time. Okay, 3.30. And yes. then mine is at 4 o'clock? Yes. PM. Okay. Yes. Which is 3 my time, yes. Okay. All right. So we have three more minutes left. So make sure you complete your quiz and your attestation. If you have done all of that and have no other questions, feel free to log off. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. We do have a um, exam review. That is that should be coming up pretty quickly. Let me look at my calendar here. Dr. Right. Ford, what does this mean by what is an ethical dilemma? I feel like that's a very loaded question. Is it looking for like an example of an ethical dilemma? I just put the definition from definition. the notes. Yeah, just okay. yeah. definition. Oh, and we do have an exam review on Monday for exam two. You all, just as a reminder, if you can log in, it's at 9 a.m. I think it's 9 a.m. your time or my time. I'm not sure the time, but um, the schedule is out. So just let you know, the first exam review for um, exam two is Monday. So I'll send the reminder out with that schedule on there because I know it was one Monday, next Monday. I think you want to say that Friday and Saturday too. So it is weekend ones. Okay, sweet. Because I work, I work. I'm a medical assistant. I work in a doctor's office. So those, oh man. Okay. So we have them different days and different times. And we also have the, um, we send out the links. So okay. it's not mandatory, but we just make them available. So just to let y'all, that's up and coming because we do have that exam coming up. What's that next week? Week seven? Week, was this five, six? Is it week six or seven? Seven. Let me look at the course room. Let's see. Exam two is today is week five, right? This is mm -hmm. week five. Yes. It's like this okay. time is going by so fast. Let's see. It's going too fast. <laughs> so let's I'm see. too close to the end. Mm -mm. I can't be going out like this. Let's see. Week five. This week. We got quiz week six, exam week seven. It is. And group seven. project is due. Yes. It's like um, week seven. So. so on the group project, just to clarify, you said that we are to combine all the work that everybody does into one paper. Yes. Correct? Yes, that's and correct. And all submit the same paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if you don't turn it in, the attendance people will look at you not contributing or being absent for that week. And so even though on the group project, if one person turns it in and everyone's name is listed, they're looking at that a submission is not there by the other team members. And so. And then I know it says like group project. Um, I don't remember the word. It says like evaluations. How are we going to be submitting those or are we submitting those? You're submitting those, but it does not count against um, the group. It's just so that we can just get some feedback. So it's like a- So how do, how do we do those? We just type those in an individual paper and submit them as well? No, it's a, a form that you can put. Let me go to it here. Okay. It is a form. And I, we might have to upload it. I think we had to upload it so that you all could um, actually open it up and complete it. Yes, let me put that on my to-do list. It is not up under the group project. Okay, so perfect. Can... I was about to say, I didn't see a form, so mm -hmm. I wasn't sure how we needed to do it. Yes, yeah, so um, that's on my to-do list. So more, for more information to come on that. But yeah, there's a form that you all complete and you just evaluate your team members. So we'll get that up for you so you can turn it in. Now, what if you haven't already, like you can't reach out to your team members? 
Like if you can't get a hold of them. So you all haven't worked at all as on as a group on mm -hmm. anything on the project. So it hasn't been started. I mean, you still have more time, but put it in the email that includes everyone in the email and then include me in the email also. And okay. then we'll um, go from there. If we don't, you know, we just depend on what the responses are. We'll go from there. Okay. Something. You may have to do something individual, but include a group email with all group members and then me in the email as well. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. You all have a good evening, a good rest of the night and a weekend. Thank you, you too. Mm -hmm. See you all tomorrow, the three that signed up.